Well, you made a good choice being here today. I don't know if you were here last night. Who was here last night? Oh, some of you are two-timers. Okay. Um, it was hot. It was hot here, and it was crowded. And those of you that are here today, it's relaxed. It's air-conditioned, and uh, it's Christmas Day. How exciting can that be? And we can see that by you being here that in seven years we need to do this again because uh, you obviously want to come out here and worship the Lord. But there's always this big question. I want to take a poll right now to find out. You know, when it comes to opening presents, how many of you are Christmas Eve people? Christmas Eve people. Got to open the presents on Christmas Eve. You seem to shame some of you. Yeah, it's us. How many of you are Christmas Day people? Wow, that's a lot. Well, obviously... Uh, I, no, I, you know what? Not obviously. I, I'm really impressed. How many of you already opened the presents and now you're here? All right, how many of you opened them later? Yeah, we're not open ours till like five or six today. I know it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. My sister's flying in. She's in town right now driving into uh, this area of uh, Windermere. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot. But I, but I was always a Christmas Day person, but I grew up in a Christmas Eve house. And my mom's here, and I'm very nervous about saying that. But they loved opening on Christmas Eve. But I was always like, man, I want to wait to Christmas Day. I was actually, I want to open on both days. How can I work that out, right? Can I open them on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? But uh, this is, you know, that, that anticipation that happens at Christmas is just what makes it so much fun. And we just get so excited but what happens after Christmas, right? You know, we're all, I mean, I mean, what's next? Well, we got the 26th. The 26th is a downer. Now, if you're Canadian, it's Boxing Day, okay? <laughs> Which, you know, any Canadians here, I didn't mean to insult you with that. But, I mean, it's just, you know, they just box things up, right? And they return them. I mean, that's all that, that tomorrow is. <laughs> it's return day. And now you're going, tomorrow I'm in lines, Tomorrow I'm facing more crowds. And there was all this anticipation and hype. I mean, think about it. When did it start this year? I mean, you were picking out Halloween costumes, and there were candy canes on the same aisle, right? It's getting crazy. It, it's, it's moving like two months now ahead. And so now we just can't wait for this day. But the reality is it could be a letdown afterwards. So much hype, and then what? Now, let, let's think about Mary and Joseph here. You know, what was their morning like? You know, they just had this, you know, this big day, right? All this anticipation, you know, all that hype. The baby had finally arrived. Think of what they had heard nine months ago. You want to talk about hype? An angel shows up. And in Luke, the angel says this, Greetings to Mary. You are highly favored. I would love an angel to show up and tell me that. You're a great guy, Troy. That's what he was saying to Mary. Mary's troubled. Like, whoa, what is this? I mean, what's, what's coming next with this? Angel says, hey, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. I love that part. And we spent so many, so many hours trying to figure out our child's names and have an angel show up and say, the name's Jesus. Thank you. Now we can check out of the hospital. <laughs> he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary, obviously, right? How? I mean, I'm a virgin. Angel says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And goes on to say, for nothing is impossible with God. Wow. Nine months ago, the hype started for her. Do you think she forgot it? Do you think she, you know, the, the, the minute it happened, went, oh, whew, that's over, right? All those things that Angela told me, it's, it's done and forgotten. No, of course not. It meant a lot to her. But you know what set in at that point? It was the now what, right? That sort of feeling that we're, we're anticipating tomorrow. Now what? I mean, Mary, let's, first of all, first of all, Mary was in pain the next day, okay? Can we be realistic about this? You know, we try to paint the picture as she's all smiling and everything, but some of you know the next day is pretty painful. There was probably things like shock and doubt that had creeped in. You know, I know as a father, you know, the, when, when I saw my first child, Riley, come out, my first words were, he's blue. 
Now, I, I thought I was telling the doctors something they didn't know. You know, I was like, you guys aren't paying attention. It doesn't seem like he's the color he's supposed to be. But they didn't seem concerned, and he turned out fine, so it was all right. But my second thought, I, I mean, I hate to say this. My second thought was, how am I going to pay for this? <laughs> how am I going to, I mean, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. What, how, how are we going to, we've got a child, and all of a sudden, like, responsibility landed on me on that day. And, 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 and these are the realistic things that happen when you have a child, especially the first one. The next thing was it was kind of quiet. You know, think about the night before, the angels pronouncing the birth and everything. I mean, this, 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 this huge production that had occurred, and then all of a sudden, it's crickets. You know, and then what about the loneliness, right? The shepherds have come by, they had all these guests in town. Yay, yay, good to see you. Oh, that's great, that's great. They're all gone. Now what? And then there's the busyness, right? You have all the excitement of the busyness of getting ready for guests. The guests leave. And then you have that different kind of busyness, right? It's that sort of day-to-day -day sort of thing. This was all true for Mary and Joseph. All of it was true. Remember, it's not Christmas for them. There was no bank holiday, no school break or anything like that. It was just another day. Christmas for us can be the same way, can it? You know, there's a lot of pain that comes in. Some of it's physical pain of doing all this work and standing in the kitchen all day. You know, some of it's the emotional pain of having the relatives in town and dealing with all those sort of things. You know, there could be loneliness to set in if maybe you're not with anyone this Christmas. Or maybe you're not with someone who was here last Christmas and has passed away. There's loneliness that comes in. You know, there's also some of the doubt. How are we going to pay for all of this? Right? We're expecting that bill to show up in January. The quietness that, that settles in. That slow, steady grind of life. We've been looking so forward to Christmas. And then it's over. But we don't have to forget the promises of Christmas, do we? It doesn't really have to end, does it? Did it, did it end for Mary? No, it says that she treasured these things in her heart. What does that mean? That means she remembered all the things that the angel had said nine months before and kept them in her heart, and it kept her getting through day by day. Those promises of saying, hey, God is with us, that your son here is going to be a king, that he's going to save us, and most of all, that nothing is impossible with God. Let's look at what happened just after Christmas, and we can see that God continued to give to them, even after he had given them the child, that there were still presents that were left uh, to be unwrapped. The first thing we see here is that God encouraged them. God encouraged them, and they needed that. And we see the story of Simeon and also of Anna. And this happens after the time of purification. I mean, after you're dealing with blood and all that kind of stuff, right, the birth, you've got to have seven days of purification. Then on the eighth day, you take the child to go be circumcised. So... Thankfully, they're right there in Bethlehem, right? It's not that far a walk to go over to the temple and to have the child circumcised. Well, while they're there, they meet a guy. And the guy's name is Simeon. And he says uh, that he is righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. He's basically saying, I can die now, a happy man. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at this. Boy, wouldn't you have loved that when your child was born, that the doctor sort of lifts his child up? What a great kid this is going to be. The most awesome child ever. I mean, it's kind of that Rafiki moment, right, of just sort of holding the child up, you know, to the sky. I mean, this was that kind of moment. Do you think that encouraged them? Do you think they needed that sort of encouragement after all these things have happened and then that slow, steady grind of the day-to-day -day set in? God gave them this encouragement. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel 
to be a sign that will be spoken again so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Basically, this is going to change your life, Mary. Wow. What encouragement they needed. What encouragement we need to hear now than now, uh, then, that God is saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Later, they meet up with Anna. She's a prophetess. And she's 84 years old. And she came up to them in the moment. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Two people came into their lives to encourage them. God encouraged Mary and Joseph after Christmas. Does he continue to encourage us after Christmas? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen to some of these verses that are so encouraging and what they have to say. Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. I will uphold you at the right hand of my righteousness. What's he saying? You're not going to be alone. You're not going to be alone. I'm going to be there with you. In fact, I'm going to prop you up when you feel like falling down. In Jeremiah 29, one of my favorite verses, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says this interpretation. Uh, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of, of evil, and to give you, and I like this, an expected end. He knows exactly what his purpose is for us. So he has a plan for you. Is that an encouragement? What about in John 15, when Jesus is talking, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. What's he saying there? Jesus is saying, hey, I picked you to be on my team. You didn't pick me to be on your team. And you know what? Since I picked you, I got something for you, and it's going to be prosperous. It's going to be fruitful. In Romans 8, we see encouragement. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What's the encouragement here? He's saying that he's looking upon us as if we were his own child paying attention to us, knowing what we're doing. You know what your children are doing right now, I hope. And, uh, and, and it's the same way with God. He's keeping his eye on us. That's encouraging. Later on in Romans 8, it says this, if God is for us, who can be against us? There's no bullies that are going to pick on you. There's nobody that's going to come over and take your lunch or anything like that. You have God on your side, and he is going to make sure you're okay. Philippians, we see encouragement. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can get anything done as long as it's along with God's purposes and he's on your side and he wants you to do it, it will get done. What great encouragement we need to hear after Christmas, all year round. All of it because of the coming of the Christ child. The second thing we see is that God provided for Mary and Joseph. Now think about the best gift you ever got. Think about the best gift, your whole lifetime you ever got. For some of you kids, it's what you got today, right? Or maybe the thing you brought today to the server. That's the best gift you ever got. For me, I remember <clears throat> very clearly what it was. And it was the Atari 2600. Thanks, Mom. I really like the Atari 2600. Man, I, don't, I, I can't remember if it was late high school or whenever it was, but at the video game, and it had Space Invaders on it. I know, so archaic. But ours just going... Burn, burn. That was it. I, it was so much fun. And of course, it unlocked the whole future of me playing games, going to the Atari 5200, the Coleco, the Xbox, and everything. But wow, that was fun. I remember that. That, had a, that just had a lot of fun about it. The other one, Christmas gift that comes to mind, is this VCR that my wife bought me when we were early stages of our, of our marriage. Now, I know today, some of you are going, the VCR was $29 at Best Buy. Back in the day, when they first came out, they were like 350 bucks. Now, 20 years ago, that was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. It was really a lot of money. But Barbie knew that that's what I wanted. She knew that I wanted a VCR. And somehow, she was doing childcare and babysitting without me ever knowing it. Now, it disturbed me a little bit that I didn't know where she was going at night or during the day, and she was making money somehow, but she did it. And when this thing showed up, she told me the sacrifice she had gone through to get that present, and I was blown away. So some of those things come to mind at times that people have given you gifts. What about the first gifts that were ever given on a sort of a Christmas? The whole reason that we give 
gifts at Christmas, yes, is for the Christ child, but we really look to the wise men. And in Matthew 2, we see that they, uh, they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and on coming to the house, which we believe at this time they're in Nazareth, they had gone there, it's about two years afterwards, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures, presented them with gifts of gold and incense, of frankincense and myrrh. Now again, remember, it's been about two years afterwards because it took them time to see the star, pack up their stuffs, right, get on their camels, whatever they needed to do, go across this territory, run into Herod, say, hey, Herod, where's this the child? He's like, huh, child, king, what are you talking about? And, and then they, they, they turn their direction and find out, okay, well, we need to go to the house where uh, Mary and Joseph and this Christ child died. This took a long time. And then Herod says, he kills all the children, right, two years and younger, and it's all based on two years and younger because he had realized that it was two years ago that this star had showed up. So the wise men show up at the age of two, two years after this first Christmas. How are things for Mary and Joseph? Well, it's probably okay. He's probably settled into his business once again. He's probably got the you know, the carpentry, he's kind of, carpentry's kind of like a handyman. He's like a handyman. He can do stonework, he can do woodwork, he can do all kinds of things. He's probably got his business back. Things are fine. All of a sudden, these people show up, right? These, these uh, wise men from afar show up and they have gifts. A and look at what they gave. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Now, I don't know how many of you children say, hey, guess what I got you? I got you some frankincense. Like, I want the video game, you know? I want the dolly that talks and walks and does all this kind of stuff. What was the use of that? Well, because of what Herod did, they had to leave town in a rush. They had to get out because they knew that Herod wanted all the babies dead, all the ones that were two years, so they had to go. That money ended up being the provision for them. The stuff that they could resell with the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh on the market would be able to finance them for the next few years while they hid in Egypt. So God is providing for them after Christmas. Now, does God provide for us? Is he there? Does he know our struggles? Does he know what's going on in our lives? Does he somehow find a way to have people show up on our doorstep, literally sometimes, with the money that we need to get by? The answer is yes. Look at these verses that show that God still provides for us after Christmas. Matthew 6, uh, 31 to 32. Therefore, don't take any thought, don't even worry, right? Saying, what shall we eat? What do we drink? And, and how are we going to be clothed? For after all these things, the Gentiles, the non-believers, uh, seek after. But your heavenly Father knows what you need, and you need all of these things. He knows your list, right? You, he knows what you need. He knows what's on the list, and he's saying, I'm willing to provide it for you. He doesn't have to check the list twice as the other guy does. He knows it all the time. Every day he's checking your list all the time. He knows what it is that you need. In Luke 12 it says, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, because you're of more value than many sparrows. He's saying, look, I take care of sparrows. I take care of the grass. I take care of the flowers. I'm taking care of you. Don't worry about it. He knows the details about you down to the number of hairs on your head. In Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He gives according to riches. That's such a blessing for us. It's not that he wants you to be, have a poor mindset all the time. What are you saying here? I want to bless you in some way. It may be through money, but it may be through relationship. It may be through some needed food at a time when you don't have any. In some way, he's going to bless you. And we've just seen that at this Christmas. So many families, because of this year we had in 2011, so many families were not able to, to have a Christmas. But so many other families stepped in and said, how can we help? How can my small group help? What can we do to give so that someone else can have a great Christmas? God was working through other people to provide for others within this church. The third thing is God protected them. You know, we just talked about what happened to Herod, that Herod had gotten jealous that this other king uh, had come into town. And an angel warns Joseph and says, you need to go to Egypt and you need to go now, so pack up. 
And so they took off. And through that warning, God protected them. He said, I want you in a safe place. I want you in a place where Herod could never go. It was out of his jurisdiction. And there would be no possible way for him to get to you. It took a lot of faith. It took a lot of trust. Why do we have to pack up now? These were the questions going through their head. But no matter where they went, God was taking care of them. Does he protect us? Is he still protecting us? Is that Christmas promise not applicable to us? Sure it is. Psalm 32 says this, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 146 says, The Lord watches over the alien, sustains the fatherless and the widow. He frustrates the way of the wicked. In Proverbs 18, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and they're saved. He's our protection. He's our tower. He's taking care of all types of people. No matter where you are in, in, in the social status, he's saying, I'm going to take care of you. In Isaiah, it says, No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. For every tongue that will rise against you in judgment, they will be condemned. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Nobody can say anything that can hurt you. He is going to protect you. Second Thessalonians says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Hebrews says, For he himself says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. That doesn't end on Christmas. You're not just protected. You're protected all year round. I mean, as you sit and think about the best Christmas presents you could ever get, maybe some that you're wishing for right now, the best Christmas present I could ever get, can it compare to any of these that God is promising for us? You know, we have to want this kind of encouragement. We have to want this kind of protection and this sort of provision. Is it it's only really offered to those who believe, the ones who are the sons and daughters, the ones that he's taking care of. And Jesus says, I call you my brothers and sisters. So that means we're part of the family. So Christmas doesn't have to end on Christmas. And God continues to encourage and to give and protect. In fact, he gives you the greatest present of all. Imagine if there was a present that you could open up underneath that tree. Every morning you wake up, you could open that present up and see what's on the inside. And God has said, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you that present. And it's the present of eternal life. That you open that present up every morning, every morning for the rest of your life, and you look inside, what is it? What is it? Everyone's saying, you go, oh, it's eternal life. I got eternal life. That's awesome. Yeah, next morning, get up, right? His, his, his blessings are new every morning, right? You open it up, what is it? Oh, I got eternal life. It's awesome. You keep opening that present. Every day, now and forever. What a great gift it is. Look at all the promises that come with just that gift. No more worry. What does death mean to you? If you can open up the present of eternal life. You have a new perspective on things. You have a new way of loving. You understand relationship because of the way that God loves you. There's no more fears. There's no more tears anymore. I mean, you don't have to. I mean, just think of that eternity in heaven that you are opening up every morning. You now have a purpose that comes with that present, that Christmas present. It says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. What was she treasuring? She was treasuring all of those promises. And the question is, what is it that you're treasuring in your heart? What are the things that you're keeping in your heart at this time that you can say, I'm going to open this from now on. It just isn't a Christmas promise. This is a rest of my life promise that I get to open. So the question is, do you want it? You have the opportunity to reject the present. You have the opportunity to say, I don't want to open that. I don't want all those things that are going to come with it. What a guarantee it has. What a lifetime warranty it has. Why would you say, I don't want that? Think of some of the things that you've opened up and, 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 and what kind of a joy they brought to you at that time. But how much longer is that joy going to last? Until it breaks, until it gets old, until the day-to-day -day sets in. Wouldn't you want a gift that you could open that's going to give you the kind of joy that, could, that will sustain you from now and forever. So what kind of gift do you want this Christmas? Let's pray.